Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, brought to you by the Lipscomb Pitts Breakfast Club. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference, so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now, here's our host, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We are joined by, he's a good friend of mine. He's doing amazing things. He's definitely a change maker. He's also part of the class for the New Memphis Institute that we went through together, the LDI. So we'll talk a little about that. But he is the executive director for Knowledge Quest, Marlon Foster. How are you doing, Marlon? How's it going, Jeremy? Good to be here. So let's start. The fun of this podcast, obviously, is we'll talk about Knowledge Quest. We'll talk about the work you're doing in your neighborhood. And that's a big part of your storyline is the neighborhood that you grew up in is the neighborhood you're working in to change. But let's start with a little bit of your backstory. So let's go back to Marlon as a child and give us a little bit of your childhood. What was it like with your parents? And tell us where you were raised here in Memphis. Wow. Actually, the neighborhood that I still live, work, and worship in, as you alluded to, is actually the neighborhood uh, of my youth, my family house. uh, We still own it. Uh, It's still there. And uh, my grandparents actually moved uh, in that South Memphis community back in 1947. Um, It was around 1955 when they moved in the house that that I ultimately was born in. But I had an awesome upbringing. It was three generations uh, in every home uh, on my street. So, you know, grandparents there with and growing up with your uh, first cousins, like your sisters and brothers, so it was a real, it was a real nice uh, upbringing uh, there, with just a very tight community environment. And uh, and again, and today, uh, still there. But I was, you know, a kid, and um, always had a little quick wit. And uh, growing up uh, right there uh, in our neighborhood, it was you know everyone right there in the neighborhood schools. It was. I remember scenes, uh, the teachers calling my grandmother, wanted to borrow a rocking chair for school plays. It was that intimate where they knew you. And, um, and, and that, you know, moving from there, you know, we had, I went to Stafford Elementary. I, Bellevue would come and glean students from Stafford. So I ended up going there and, and jumped on over onto my paternal side to Melrose High School. Uh, but yeah, but growing up, actually, a lot of that uh, speaks to what I do now uh, with being able to uh, really want to stay connected and really relive that and have that experience for my children, this kind of real tight community feel. How many brothers, sisters, talk about how large of a family? Wow. Uh, my mom had two, uh, and uh, I'm the youngest there, and uh, there was also uh, two additional cousins in the house. Uh, so every family unit had their own bedroom. So my mom and, and, and me and my brother, we had a bedroom. My aunt and and her daughter had a bedroom. My other aunt and her daughter had as good that they only had. My mom was all over two kids, but each, uh, yeah, but each each family, my uncles there, uh, grandparents, and it was just a real nice. You know, I had a grandfather that would, you know, have on overalls, but he would put on that jacket and come and sit at the dinner table. So it was that type of uh, family. And uh, even when I fast forward to, you know, my college years at Lemoyne, that became a big reality check because what I was experiencing, I mean, next door, across the street, around the corner, uh, it was not happening. And uh, so it was real reality check based on what I was experiencing, what was happening uh, right around me. Well, and as a child, I mean, just what you're describing, I've got to believe it was very open, accessible, you know, playing outside, being with friends and family and all very connected. And even to your point, walking around and just you know, family being there, but but all kind of right there, front and center, close to you, right? And now when you look at so much of what we do, even as neighbors, like we stay inside, we don't really talk, we insulate ourselves. And so, you know, when you talk about your childhood, what what's maybe one memory that stands out either around a holiday, but just something that puts a smile on your face that really kind of describes that that feeling of growing up together? I'll tell you something I valued more so if I got, as I've gotten older. I had a uh, a birthday uh, last Monday, so uh, you know I'm I'm another year old. Happy birthday! Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so I'm 44 now, but for 44 years uh, we have gathered. I have been at the same table, or gathered around table with those three generations for every Thanksgiving and every Christmas. 
And, um, and and as I've gotten older, I really took that for granted. You know, it's just it's just what we did at one point. It was every Sunday, uh, three generations gathering back, even when everyone moved out of the family house, coming back. So that's probably the most fun memory. And I think now, even in my work, uh, connected to Knowledge Quest, connected to the church around the faith. It's all about uh, gathering around table. So I see now those influences and those fun memories uh, still played out in my everyday life. You played sports. Tell us a little about the sports, and then we'll use that as a little bit of the transition for the catalyst. So talk about your sports. Yeah, so it was um, it was Bellevue primarily, and uh, by the time I got to high school, I, I kind of thought I was a little too cool and began to drift a little bit. But, you know, I played football. I ran track. I was the wide receiver on the football team. I was um, the, the go-to sprinter. Uh, for the track team, uh, long jump, I mean, you know, the whole nine. So, uh, yeah, it was a great uh, experience. And, um, and again, I was right there with a kid, um, you know, Pierre Ramon Henderson. Uh, I talk about him uh, as far as my, you know, my drive for Knowledge Quest. But, you know, we were right there together. When I was wide receiver, he was quarterback. Uh, when I ran that first leg of the 440, I handed the baton to him. So, yeah, it was a – and, again, it was those families where we were at church together, we were at school together. We were in a neighborhood together. And carry that story forward with what happened to this young man that was the quarterback that you passed the baton to that was your good friend. Yeah, Pierre Ramon Henderson. I mean, even choir boys in the church choir. Uh, but I, I talk about my drive for knowledge, which really goes back to our high school years and and, and we were even living together in, in high school, had our own spot and could tease our friends. You're still at home with your mom and dad. We have our own place. But, you know, it was a lot of, you know, devilment and, and, and really uh, drifting that went along with us being teenagers and just really falling victim uh, to a lot of the lures and temptations um, of the neighborhood. And it kind of cut across the field a little bit. You know, when we were, um, he had turned 18, uh, still 17, he got killed. You know, neighborhood fight. Uh, kid had a gun, shot and killed him. And, um, at that time, you know, it was a lot of me still struggling. You know, imagine that young and a kid you've known all your life and you're going through all those emotions around that uh, and, and, and even rebelling about that and just really in a confused state. Uh, but it really kind of came out of that saying, OK, I need to make his life have value. And that affects my personal life. Uh, because in my mind, then as I matured a little bit, you know, if I kept living the same way, it means his life didn't have meaning. It was just a speed bump on my road and I kept going. So it started with me trying to honor our friendship and honor his life. And and then from there to see how can I influence others uh, based on uh, that experience that I had, you know, thus knowledge quest and reaching out to other children. And that was in high school. So you're 17, 18 for him. At what point do you realize, because you go and you go to college and instead of leaving this area, you go right back to exactly what we're talking about, to your neighborhood. At what point does it hit you, wait a second, instead of the speed bump and me continuing, I want to make this major change in my life, but also to this major change in my own neighborhood. At what point does that hit you? It really was a couple of years. I mean, I still... um went right back after immediately after his death I was still a knucklehead I was still that kid you probably crossed the street you know you saw him on one side you know just really uh, knucklehead out there really what I say now really being a part of bringing the neighborhood down and um, I had no intention of going to college uh, my thing was I wanted to own a neighborhood business and um, you know kids laugh now but there's an old liquor store that used to be at the corner of Mississippi and Walker that was my dream I'm like man they're making money and that's legitimate I need to own that liquor store that was my dream I wanted to save up money get that liquor license get that building and uh and in my immaturity it was by any means necessary just I can you know I would do whatever I had to do then I could get to a point of doing the right thing uh, so it was a lot of fence straddling and you know I was that kid I didn't mention part of my childhood you know I was that kid with the lemonade stand um my mom worked at Cablevision. I would get all the buttons. I was MTV generation, you know, heart of Generation X. I was the kid selling uh, MTV buttons. I was. I had a relative that that sold. Uh, they worked at a, at a makeup company. You know, I would get all that that would be to my aunts and mom and take it to Bellevue. I was. They called me the Avon lady. Well, yeah. hey, when you look at Damon John though with Fubu, that's how he started. He oh, started yeah. out taking the clothes out to you know street corners and everything else. So you look at Damon John Shark Tank. I mean, he's <laughs> that's where it starts, right? That's it. That's it. When you're in a community where there's just not a lot of economic activity, and to say in a neighborhood where there are no leaves shaking in the trees, you know, you're just trying as a kid to 
find any way, especially as you get your manhood and you're, you know, now 13, 15, 17. And, you know, I would just do that. So I always had this entrepreneurial spirit. And um, so, you know, mom was like, hey, you're always trying to sell stuff. Things get you in trouble. Why don't you go around the corner and take up Lamont? Uh, but for me, so your mom really is the one that pushed you to go to college. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. She really pushed me. You know, my my dad, he uh, we were close. He wasn't in the home with us uh, growing up, but I was I was close with him. Uh, and he was you know, he had a job. He he, he worked at uh, old Kimberly Clark uh, by the time I was coming up of age. And ironically, what happened is I just wanted to get a job, save my money, start my business. Uh, so I went to LeMoyne. Uh, and it was still, I still had entrepreneurial aspirations, but even prior to LeMoyne, um, the reason I went there and went to college is because to work in the summers at Kimberly Clark, they were going to hire children of the employees if they were college bound. So I immediately ran out to old drones, junior college, just to say I was accepted at a college. Uh, I took that in to the job and wouldn't know it has to be a four year institution. So then I said, why don't you go right there to LeMoyne? So I went around there, got accepted at LeMoyne, uh, and I went working at, at that job, showing up 45 minutes early every day. I mean, I'm 18 years old by then, making 12 bucks an hour with three 30-minute breaks. I'm like, this is golden, you know. Uh, but I think back on that, even in high school, uh, I was cutting a class, and it was a biology teacher that I was very uh, fond of that just made me go into – uh, the ACT exam room. I didn't go to any study session, didn't practice. He just said, hey, kids, you need to go in there. And uh, he just made me go in that room. And if it wasn't for that that kind of happenstance moment, I wouldn't have, have even taken the college entry exam. Um, so, you know, that had happened. Right. Uh, so when I got ready to get this job, I did have an ACT score. That was that was a decent ACT score, uh, by the way, uh, with Jess. And I think back and say, wow, what if I would have studied? Right, I right. Been, you know, 30 plus club or something. But, um, you know, so I ended up going there. And at the end of the summer, like, kid, go ahead and go to school. We're not hiring. This is just a summer experience. And that's how I ended up at LeMoyne. And I entered into business uh, because that was, you know, a lot of my aspirations uh, to want to start my own business. I said, okay, if I'm going to go to college, I'll do that and just take up business. Well, that seed was planted. So, I mean, all of a sudden you have this internship experience and you're thinking, wait a second, this is great. I'm making money. I can, you know, move in the right trajectory. I have a career going. And then so they themselves said, wait a second, no, this is a summer experience. You need to really focus on your education. So kind of really all these sides, your your mom, professionals, teachers, everybody kind of mentoring and guiding you saying, hey, focus on school, focus on school. So at what point then does Knowledge Quest kick in? So, you know, obviously you're going through school. You've had this traumatic experience with your best friend. You have this um, this this spark that's in you to want to make a difference, to be an entrepreneur. At what point does Knowledge Quest begin? Senior year and uh, preparing for senior year. And Lemoyne is a is an institution where they walk once a year. So I got done in December. I was having to wait until the spring to walk. So I was taking all that time that whole year, that kind of five or six month period, really getting my business plan together. Um, didn't want the liquor store by then, but I had this neat, uh, this neat sports apparel concept uh, that I wanted to do, you know, getting uh, refurbished sports apparel and, and kind of uh, starting a business that way. And, um, but what happened when I started looking at the demographics of my neighborhood, trying to do my market analysis and all that, because I still wanted a neighborhood based business. That's when I was introduced to my neighborhood for the first time. And I mean, I mean, we were ranked number one in all the wrong areas. Um, I remember the average annual household income being fifty seven hundred dollars a year. Now I'm thinking I want to make that a month. Uh, but it was a real reality check. I knew about the street violence from my best friend. But I mean, highest teenage pregnancy rate, highest lowest birth rate. And this was back in 1995. Uh, so that became this kind of eye-opening experience when I'm, you know, 21, 22, I think I know everything and I don't even know what's going on right around me. So I came out of that experience saying, wait a minute, I need to pour myself back into the neighborhood. And when you put that reality check alongside me already still struggling with the death of my childhood best friend, those two kind of came together. There is a way that I could, you know, what I want to do did not exist. So I had to create my own job because I wanted to work with with youth 
And in my census tract, uh, that was census tract 50, uh, there was not even a daycare center. And this was in the heyday of daycare centers where it was really, everybody was opening a daycare center. There was not even a daycare center, uh, not to mention uh, an after school program. So when I began to look at the youth and then seeing all the other things, I mean, I just start, you know, really light bulbs just began to go off. You know, we need to, a preschool, we need the Knowledge Quest after school program. We need, you know, a teenage academy, adult career academy. We need quality of life for seniors. We need housing. We need entrepreneurship. We need youth entrepreneurship. So I ended up with about a half inch thick plan of all the things I wanted to do in the neighborhood, uh, really just based on uh, that epiphany I had when I saw uh, the real figures for the first time. I think there's so much similarity. One of our good friends, Dr. Manny Ahome, who started Samaritan's Feet, grew up in Nigeria, dirt poor, was the you know the child you see on the Discovery Channel with the bucket of water and takes it down, and uh, you know millions of people around the world face footborne infection and. You know, he comes to the U.S. on a full ride, ends up becoming an IT successful professional, and he goes back and he sees the need, and he's like, "Well, somebody else needs to do something about this, right?" And then it hits him where the epiphany: "Wait a second, that's me." Yes. And in many cases, you symbolize that exact same part of it, where it's is your, you know, you're, you're going off to college, you're pursuing this entrepreneurial track, you come back and you look around your neighborhood, and you're like, "Wait a second, look at all of these gaps, look at all of these needs." Somebody needs to do something about it. That somebody's me, right? Okay. So, and, and to me, that's the part that makes you a real change maker, is the fact that you 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 are. I mean, you are living it. And, and the other side of it. So, tell listeners first. Give them a little bit of a background. When we talk about Knowledge Quest, I think it, it speaks a little bit to what you do already in the sense of you know, per, you're pursuing knowledge, you're helping youth, you're, you're helping them achieve, but there's so much to what you do. So in a nutshell, give us a little bit of a teaser for the work that Knowledge Quest does. So back with, with all those ideas, there was a wise gentleman that said, kid, find you one thing you want to do in that and make it happen. And, uh, and that became, for me, it was about community development. People are the most valuable asset in a community children amongst the the people so let's start with that human capital so it was really just a logical practical thing to start with children uh and that became youth development uh we kind of did that i think quite well we got a little typecast as a youth development organization and uh now we're really realizing a lot of the broader community uh, development aspects that we've um always longed for and it's worked out uh quite nicely by starting with the children so knowledge quest today you know we understand ourselves as um H2O, you know, we're just providing a cup of water. But that's our latest thing, you know, and it's home health and opportunities for youth. So through home, uh, the first H, we have a couple of programs, uh, family stability for our most vulnerable parents. This is basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. Uh, but then they walk alongside our case managers for nine months to determine how can you not be in this dire uh, straits position again. And then there's a universal parenting place. Uh, there's one at Baptist Women's. There's another pilot at Knowledge Quest. Uh, basic parenting strategies and tools through licensed professionals uh, in a non-fee-based, non-judgmental environment. Uh, the other H is health, healthy lifestyles, healthy communities. So we've transformed all these vacant lots in our neighborhood, 25 vacant lots, three abandoned buildings have now been repurposed uh, to a USDA certified organic learning farm. Uh, and then the O of the H2O is just the opportunities for youth. So we decided in 2012 to just do more of the same in the same neighborhood. So we have three operating sites, pre-K through 12, um, all right on or right off Walker Avenue. And uh, Walker runs about two miles between Bellevue and 3rd, and we call that stretch the Knowledge West Kid Zone. So, I mean, just, you know, for those listening, you already hear the breadth of services and opportunities, right? It's working with kids, after school programs, you have farming, you have, oh, yeah. um, you know, the the parenting. So it covers a, a very wide range, but it's all focused on helping people. The other thing that makes you very unique that I personally love it goes back to your idea about just the power of people. You're very good at leveraging relationships and figuring out, okay, you may not have a lot of money, but you have a lot of value. And I can find if we need painting, for instance, we can use you as a painter. If we need um, landscaping or you know, the lawn mode, you can find a way to trade out services. And so you're very good at figuring out, okay, what assets do you have and how can we work together to get there, right? It's not always about just the money side. So you're a great problem solver. You're also a great convener and you use the church, which I want you to talk about, the, the church as a convening ground as well, but as a catalyst to be able to draw people in, people that of all ages, of all socioeconomic levels that are all in this neighborhood, to give them purpose, to guide them, but ultimately to push them through these opportunities through Knowledge Quest. 
it's really amazing. So talk, talk a little about just the people side, but also the spirituality and the church side, because I think those two kind of go together. I think on the people side, you know, I just I just love people. Um, they, um, I was a student at Memphis Theological, and they would, right toward the end, there was this court that said, hey, you know, I've been in ministry now. We founded uh, Christ Quest Community Church 12 years ago, so Knowledge Quest is not a faith-based organization, but there's an opportunity right on our campus um, uh, where we have a church. And, uh, you know, that's the full expression um, of me, you know, they, they, in this class, like you're either a pastor or a preacher. You just know you may be a, you know, a pastor that has to preach, or you may be a preacher that happens to pastor. But in your heart, you're one or the other. And that conversation really, really struck home. And I'm a pastor at heart. I just love, uh, I love the people. And I think all people have gifts. Uh, I think um, all people have leadership potential. And it's about tapping that passion. So. Um, through some of the work of uh, John McKnight that we're very connected to that I read personally around asset-based community development. It's like people have assets. So you take that from a the business side of things of, you know, where are your resources, where are your assets? And we all know there's a value in human capital. Uh, I think the, the way um, th- that we look at it is that even amongst people that don't have economic capital, even in uh, under-resourced communities, uh, we still pull out that human capital. So, for instance, Knowledge Quest is relatively small, but it's still $2 million that's going through our organization. So how in a neighborhood where the average annual household income is now up to $14,000 uh, a year, how does that circulate and benefit those around? So it starts with hiring. So at each of our sites, there's a employee or parent or neighbor that works for Knowledge Quest. Uh, there's a neighborhood crew Uh, that washes all the vans. There's another crew that has the landscaping contract. Uh, There's another guy that does all the light carpentry. Uh, There's another guy that does small engine repair for all the stuff on the farm. So it's about how can we circulate resources through a neighborhood if we are this kind of nucleus right here, this kind of oasis right in the midst of of a lot of dire, uh, distressing, uh, poverty-related environments. So, uh, But it it starts from that premise and that principle that people have assets. When our parents were knowledge to us, they volunteer their time in lieu of payment. So you may not be able to afford this, which probably equates to a $100, $150 a week experience, but you have time. Um, So parents give their time in lieu of payment. Uh, but as far as how Knowledge Quest and Christ Quest comes together, you know, the church is about 90 percent unchurched. Uh, we experience a lot of things that would be mind blowing, even to my church experience growing up. Uh, but it's just when you're working with a population that has not they don't have that context or even that high regard for what's considered sacred space by some. You know, I'm 13, 15. This is my first time coming to church. You know, my average age of baptism is about 30, 35 years old as a kid in that same building. You know, you're always a child. You know, there's many adults even getting baptized. I've baptized uh, my next door neighbor that grew up next door to my family house all my life. He was 83 years old. That was like a highlight of my faith experience to baptize Mr. Scotty, you know, and it was him that helped me two weeks later. A 76-year-old came in and was embarrassed. And it was Mr. Scotty that had not been in church in his 83 years, had only been saved and baptized for two weeks, that I was able to call in the office uh, to take the embarrassment away from the 76-year-old. So it's, it's those type of experiences. But, you know, it's a front lines ministry. And I share that when folks come and join the church. It's a difference to do to go to third world countries and do ministry. It's a difference to come into the urban pockets of Memphis, you know, once a month and to do ministry. But every Sunday, it is a very real and raw context of people struggling and needing help. And a lot of them are still struggling uh, with various vices uh, as we worship together. Uh, But for me personally, Knowledge Quest and Christ Quest is like that's like the full embodiment of Marlon Foster. Um, our family we eat a lot of yogurt, and I'll always get to swirl. But if you look at chocolate vanilla <laughs> swirl, I'm, you know it's kind of like if you if you put those two ministries together, it would the knowledge quest and Christ quest is, is the full expression of me. It's like where you don't know where the chocolate starts or vanilla ends, right? Where the juice is melted, it's all blended. That's me with these two initiatives. It's just I wouldn't want to do anything else outside of what I do now, and that's really a blessing uh, to be able to wake up, you know, every morning and live out that experience. I love it. 
So that's a great description too, great illustration. <laughs> now we want yogurt. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm getting hungry. Um, so talk about – obviously this is a much larger conversation. When you talk about changing the poverty rate, when you talk about really creating systematic change across the city, but this is something that almost every city across America, definitely every top 50 city faces – is how do you create real change? How do you help those in need? And you're doing it. I mean, to your point, you are in the trenches. You see this every single day. There is no silver bullet. There's no quick fix. It it really is people helping people being there 24-7, right? What would you recommend? Give us maybe one or two tips for other cities, for others even here in Memphis that say, we need to replicate this. And obviously, you know, the knowledge quest model in and of itself is a big piece of this. But what are some lessons you've learned doing this that you say, these are some of the things that I think really will help move our city forward or those in other cities that are facing these same challenges? Here are definitely some things that I would recommend. Again, I, I'll take it back to the people. Uh, for us, it starts with authentic relationships of trust that have been built up over time. That's by far our most valuable asset. And, you know, that process is slow, it's methodical, it's intentional, it's, 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 it's mindful uh, in a sense of how are you honoring one another, where is parity in the relationships, even when one group may be uh, resourced uh, more than another resource and more than an under-resourced group. Um, and, and once you have that kind of communal trust factor, uh, whether you're in a church or whether you're doing social service work, uh, whether you are uh, a business entity coming into community doing work, whatever you put in that container uh, is going to be successful. I think then it gets down to smart strategy. Uh, part of the Knowledge Quest Kids Own Mindset is that uh, people were right when they said, okay, Knowledge Quest, you're doing something great for those 150 kids, but you know, you know, know, how are you going to scale that? Um, you know, I was excited about the 150 kids, but when we started to look out, it was like, how can we do more of the same right where we are? So we decided with some of the models that were happening across the nation, a defined community, uh, you know, defined down to the constituent, uh, a defined geography for a defined span of time, uh, and thus this kind of cradle to career continuum. I think it's going to take that work. It's going to take a lot of investment. Uh, we have a lot of families on the adult side, uh, not to mention uh, records, uh, criminal records, uh, not to mention underemployment, uh, low skill. Uh, so when you're doing that, that requires a lot of work and a lot of investment. You know, on the flip side, uh, there's probably, you know, 40, 50 grand put into juvenile justice for one kid. You know, if you go to New York, that number swells to over 200,000 for one kid. So how do you, you know, can you imagine if I put $50,000 in the home of a family of four, I would not have any problems out of those youth. Uh, so this economic reality that exists in Memphis and other cities across the nation to really work methodically with with, uh, with families, to really see all the way through to a position of stability, uh, I think that's the work for the third sector. Uh, I think other sectors from the business sector, all the awesome things that are coming out of the chamber now, even around poverty eradication from our, our local uh, governments and administrations around that, that's what's most exciting for me when it comes to my neighborhood. That is one of the highest poverty rate uh, zip codes in areas of Memphis, to see this concerted effort of all sectors coming together uh, with real smart strategy. And I think that's what's going to make the difference. Uh, And really, I I see Memphis ultimately emerging um, um, as a model overall uh, when we bring all of these resources together toward this collective impact. You work in a very taxing, mentally draining uh, I don't want to say industry, but but what you do is tough, right? Yeah. It's it's tough physically, it's tough spiritually, it's tough mentally. Where do you draw your inspiration? Talk talk about your family and just where you draw inspiration. What what keeps you going? I think you know being living, working, worshiping, being in community uh, that is inspiring. Uh, yet at the same time taxing, um, you know. Everyone knows where I live. You know, they know where to find me Monday through Friday. They know where I'm at on Sundays. Um, and with that, you know, I started off. I mean, I was I was five years before me and my wife when we first got married. Before we ever went anywhere, even you know, was able to take a vacation. Uh, but I think some intentional time away is always needed. Really having a family 
or this understanding. I have three children. Uh, and imagine them having to share their dad with not only $500 for his kids, but all the church folks and all of that. Uh, but really working in a context where my family is always welcome. Uh, so not just around 18 years, for at least the last 10 years, my wife, she, we've worked together. She was a former Spanish teacher. Uh, with it being where children, it's a children, you know, child-centered context, that helps where we are together. Uh, but it really, um, everyone makes sacrifices. Um, there's a lot of things that, you know, you know, gunfire, something that um, really didn't bother me. But, you know, when you see your wife, Hit the, hit the floor and then now has trained your kids to get down. You know, those are the type of moments as my family began to, you know, get a little older, kids growing up, and that, that really began to kind of really hurt my heart and, and, and really have you, you know, challenged in, in what you're up to every day. Because uh, a lot of people do this kind of work, but, you know, they don't live in the neighborhood. They come and do awesome work in the neighborhood. Um, but, so you almost take that the opposite, whereas some would say, well, we've got to get out of this neighborhood. You're the opposite. You're saying, no, wait a second. I got to double down on this. I, that So to your point about the inspiration, I've got to do even more because we've got to stop this right here, right now in our own neighborhood. It, it makes it it makes it personal. And when your family from has to drive so far to get to a grocery store, you know, just for you to eat or when there is violence that affects, you know, your children and you live right there. I mean, it's a different level of intentionality. Uh, that I think the work takes on. Um, and because it's personal, you know, you have to have, you know, your family's experiencing those same uh, environments. And I think it, it brings a new lens to the work. Um, I think it brings um, a, a level of, of, a higher level of intelligence uh, to the work. Uh, and, and yes, it, it, it promotes drive. Uh, because, you know, it's every day riding down the street is walking down the street where you really can notice every piece of glass, every piece of paper, you know, when you walk the neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, so it, be, it comes having a supportive family uh, that also is excited about, you know, ministry. Uh, you know, my son is wants to be a doctor that's really rooted in his concerning love for people. You know, one of my daughters, she's like a kid can't come over our house without taking a toy away. You know, now my wife and my other daughter, they can leave everybody alone. They're, they're the <laughs> introverted ones. But, you know, we need that to balance. Uh, and, I, and I will not go without mentioning uh, my wife when you ask that question. Um, I tell them, Christ, because, you know, I'm your pastor, but my wife is my pastor. And and we're very close and intimate. We, we're we sitting on the porch together about nine months out of the year and just that time that she and I have just to really connect she's my number one encourager and supporter um, and you know I'll, I'll touch and go here probably embarrass her if she hears this but um, the way I wake up every morning is my wife on her knees beside the bed with her hand on my head praying for me and when her hand touches my head that's kind of what wakes me now you imagine it I'm talking about this is like as long as we've been married she's just a real strong woman of faith um doesn't talk a lot very very quiet uh but in her own way a very powerful uh woman of faith and i think that partnership uh that we have uh really is probably by far my number one encourager uh but it really helps to have my family the community has a, a lot of regard for for us as a family uh when we're outside and on the porch and hanging out. And of course, no couple of just kids coming to the yard and playing in the backyard. But for the most part, they let us have that moment. And it really hasn't been a lot of, you know, having to really get at somebody and say, hey, you know where to find me, you know, 60 hours a week down in all this But it's really, I think they know what we do and what we contribute. And when we're there, we get a lot of smiles, a lot of ways, but people really let us have that moment. And that was the only thing I promised my wife and kids. Uh, when we go on this journey, I promise you all, when we're at home, we're going to be able to have peace at home with one another. And uh, and it's really been that, which is really uh, remarkable. And it's a lot of testament to my neighbors and the people I hang around with every day of allowing us to kind of have that moment. Absolutely. Well, and, and to be there, to be present 100 percent for your family, to have that separation. So obviously, I mean, your wife is the perfect example where actions speak louder than words, right? So um, the, the fact that she's there praying, you know, beside you every morning without really even having to say anything, like just that one description, that one action says everything, right? What do you hope you as a father, as a husband are modeling with your actions 
for your children, especially. I mean, when you look at you know, everything you're doing and the fact that, as you said, it, it's a journey together, right? So your, your kids are seeing everything that you're doing. What do you hope that they see for you as a father that will inspire them? In other words, talk about your modeling and what you hope you're modeling for them. I think, you know, starting, you know, within the home context, you know, of really being, you know, I think that through my actions, my children are understanding, you know, how a father treats, you know, his children. They're understanding how um, a husband treats his wife. Um, so I think it starts there with just that family context and, and, and what I'm modeling there, wanting to be the best man I could be in. Um, in front of them there because, you know, one day they may decide, uh, my son may decide to get married, have a wife, my daughters may decide to have a husband, they all may decide to have children. Um, you know, how am I modeling there? Uh, but I think beyond that, for them to, you know, starting with family the first institution, but then to really see the work that happens around the faith um, and to really have a high regard for uh, our, our faith. We're Christians. So to have a high regard for, for Christ and what that ultimate model represents and how we live that out. Uh, and then from, you know, that that faith experience, then the kind of hands and heart of Christ is the way we describe it. Seeing the ministry through work like Knowledge Quest and realizing that, you know, your success is tied to those around you. And if you have been blessed, uh, as my children are, and when a neighborhood kid say, you know, y'all are rich, you know, and um, and. Uh, and, and we used to say, You're crazy, we're not rich, you know. But We're but, rich in love. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And, you know, but we thought about that. And I, and I told my wife sitting on that porch one day, I said, if we both have cars, we both have health insurance, we both, at least we're middle, middle income, you know, um, our children are not going to be at hungry. Um, we are rich in comparison to what's going on right next door. So if you represent what we represent in a neighborhood that we live in, and you know we're in this house that was built in 1900, and it's yellow, and it sits up on this hill, and it's on the corner. Um, then people see that. So how we live, even as a family, uh, speaks to not only uh, the modeling, but I think even survival in a community like ours. Uh, because when I'm out of town, and our awesome uh, MPD that really uh, serves and protects, uh, but we have to have a, a sense of reality that there are a million people in metropolitan Memphis. And we have 2,000 officers. So in a context that I live in, it's going to be those neighbors that are really going to be the ones to protect me. Uh, And it's going to be the value they have for my life and for my property. Uh, And that's going to be a direct response to how I treat them. Um, So, you know, it's that type of understanding that I'm hoping uh, that they will gather no matter where they live. Hopefully they're going to be in Memphis and, and, and continue to make our city great. Uh, but they will have values that are principle based that are beyond uh, communities and, and neighborhoods but things wherever they land will really uh, take them far. I think it's easy to see, listeners, why this man is a change maker. I mean, this is one of those podcasts that could go on for hours and I feel like we would uh, still be scratching the surface of just everything that is so good and inspiring about your life and everything you've been accomplishing and are still accomplishing and are going to be accomplishing for, for years to come. So here's kind of a fun wrap up. We just, it's a rapid fire. So it's uh, you know, quick answers, but it's a fun, just covering of, of random things. And it's not really planned on any uh, stretch on my end. I just kind of like to throw out just different things. So for starters, tell us a, a book you've recently read. Uh, Building a people of power. Give and, us a little bit of a, uh, what's that about? Uh, Robert Linthicum. Uh, that's where uh, this guy, he has these awesome experiences of this guy with a fourth grade education. He ended up being the voice to Lee Iacocca when they, uh, you know, came in and really uh, brought the industry back, uh, the car industry there some years back. Uh, he also had this other experience working with um, quote unquote outcasts in India and how schools and communities end up being built on these landfills that they were, uh, you know, kind of forced to go and reside on. So this guy really has some interesting uh, uh, concepts and, and a lot of them are, are Bible based. Uh, this whole idea that we're living out now with community churches around this Nehemiah wall concept. And this was not a wall, but how can we all grow where we're planted as communities of faith? Uh, and everyone grabs a need that the community has collective identified. And then we're able to step, step back and we don't have a wall, but we really have a close knit faith based uh, uh, collection of ministry and work that really builds the community. So, uh, 
he by far uh, stands out recently for me. Uh, if nice. I uh, gave you one more on the uh, on the uh, more of my work side, uh, we're looking at a book, The Multipliers, and that's just again all connected to human capital. So, tell us a favorite movie or a movie you've seen recently. Oh, let's see a favorite movie. We do a lot of a lot of uh, kid shows, uh, a lot of family oriented uh, movies. Uh, my last one with with my whole family was probably uh, Inside Out. Uh, that was of uh, one. So you're of, like me, where you start naming cartoons. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> with small that's kids, it's like cartoons. Yeah, it was it was a deep family <laughs> moment. I had we had one one of our children we hope could readily uh, identify uh, with that. So that was an experience that that one stands out because of the experience that kind of left from the movie theater and you kind of brought it home and it gave us a kind of uh, you know platform to do some family stuff through. So yeah, yeah, that that one stands out. What do you do to relax? I love to fly kites. Yeah. Outside of, I'll get a run in. I love, I like jogging. Uh, now with a new dog, man, my wife didn't grow up with a dog, but my baby's her 10th birthday. We now have a dog for the first time. So fall in love. So I like to run with the dog now. That's our kind of bonding moment. But personally, uh, now I've even got my little trick kites and stunt kites. So, uh, yeah, that's that's a pastime that uh, I, don't, I don't think I, I don't I've, I don't know if I've shared that. I was about to say a few I people. Yeah, would have never <laughs> expected that one, but that's what makes this so fun, right? So, uh, favorite places to go here in the mid south. And obviously, you probably have a ton, so you can just give a few. I got to give a shout out to Four Way Grill, just a neighborhood institution, and what that represents even beyond. Um, the great food. When it comes to our family hanging out, um, you know, we are right there close to uh, to Riverside Drive, and uh, we can come from Ariana, South Memphis, uh, hit Third Street, and we're there in a couple of minutes. Uh, so, yeah, we're always down there. Uh, Overton Park, you know, we're being now to have the dog, so, you know, we're hanging at the dog park, and uh, we're there. So, a lot of outdoors, picnics on the lawn, riding bikes. Uh, that's really where the stage of my family, where we are right now, just having a lot of fun. So really, we're taking in a lot of Memphis green space. Yeah. So someone has friends, family coming into town for the first time here in Memphis. Where do you recommend they go? I recommend them to the Civil Rights Museum uh, first. And I said right after that, I said go to uh, at least the next day, if not later, uh, come to Stax Museum. Uh, I'm going to uh, give them a few barbecue spots if they want poultry. I have a spot there if they want, you know, chopped pork. I have another spot if you want ribs. So I kind of really get, you know, <laughs> connoisseur like when it comes to Memphis barbecue. Uh, so I'm going to give them a couple of good eating spots. Definitely uh, want them to take in uh, those two museums and what that means to Memphis and Memphis history. Um, and then again, we're going to try to get them involved in some service. Come on to Knowledge Quest and hang out, you know. So uh, yeah, there's going to be some kind of go-to staples. Uh, when we have friends to come around. So your mom or your wife is going to cook you a birthday meal. What do they make? It's going to definitely be uh, uh, turkey and dressing. Uh, it's going to be uh, some fried corn. That's where you take it right off the cob and you uh, get it in there. Uh, it's going to be um, sweet potatoes or candy yams. It's going to be um, hot water cornbread. And this is my mom. My wife is, has her own delicacies. But for a birthday dinner, that's another thing. My mom has made me like a birthday dinner for, I don't know, ever since I became an adult. That was her way from 18 to kind of get me in. Uh, but, yeah, she is an awesome cook. And, you know, Southern cuisine, uh, I was raised up with, with grandparents. And, uh, you know, Gus's, that's my grandmother. You know, cast iron skillets, you know, frying it hard, getting that grease just right. You know, four-way, it was my grandmother and then Miss Cleves. You know, so I, I was really, Southern cuisine was big around those family tables that I mentioned every Thanksgiving, every Christmas. And, uh, yeah, so I'll get that relived out every birthday. Yeah. Nice. You're making us hungry. So, lastly, favorite quote, favorite saying? Probably be connected with so much around Dr. King. Uh, you know, I could stand on my porch and see Mason Temple. Uh, but, but his line around all wealth being a part of the commonwealth and just what that means to me as I mature uh, financially, uh, intellectually uh, with my family of never disconnecting uh, my personal gain or achievement uh, and how that connects to uh, those around me. And that that's like in my head a lot as I go through life. 
So tell listeners of the Changemakers podcast where they can learn more about Knowledge Quest. How can they follow Marlon Foster? KnowledgeQuest.org. Uh, we'd love you to come out um, uh, if you want to connect. Uh, if you're a scientist and or a mathematician, come and connect there. If you have a green thumb, come and hang out on Greenleaf Learning Farm. It's the, uh, one of the only USDA certified organic operations in town. Uh, come and learn some things that hang out there. Uh, we have so many children. Uh, we're really uh, trying to respond to our literacy crisis with about 67% of our third graders not being on grade level uh, when it comes to reading, third grade reading proficiency. So we took the hundred or so we serve, put them all on one campus that's at our main campus, and it is rooted in volunteerism. We need volunteers to commit to one hour, one day a week uh, to support a child around phonetic awareness, sight words. Uh, it's really uh, a minimal commitment that can have a great impact and really respond to a community challenge. There's really a 911 for our county. So, yeah, we'd love to get involved. KnowledgeQuest.org. Well, Marlon Foster, you are a change maker. Greatly appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all the amazing things you're doing and a little bit of your life story and inspiration. So thank you very much. Likewise, Jeremy, thank you, man. And thank you for all you do uh, to make our city great. Thank you for listening to the Changemakers podcast. To learn more about our guests and to share your story of leading by example and creating change, visit us online at thelpbc.com. Connect with us online using at the LPBC or follow the conversation using the hashtag Changemakers. Now think big, start small, and act now. Be a change maker.